something that's not been mentioned throughout the conversation so far from our investor panels this week, but something that's quite interesting is the state of inflation globally and perhaps um, your take on, you know, where's that, what's that doing for precious metals at the moment? Is that what's causing perhaps a resurgence in the gold price? Um, is it a real concern globally? Um, and, and what's your view on that sort of macro theme? Angelos, let's, let's start with you and work our way down. Thank you, Adam. Um, inflation is clearly, uh, to a certain extent, to a large extent, I would say, a result of the pandemic crisis and, and the, the way the economy closed down completely. Companies destocked, um, they froze operations. And, and once uh, the vaccination process was successfully reopening the economy, everybody is scrambling to acquire new stocks, buy new resources, and, and restart production. And, and in the meantime, the logistical structure, the logistical framework around the world was frozen. Um, the, the container lines were upset. Whatever, you know, generally all, all the logistical framework was uh, severely disrupted, and therefore costs went up significantly. But in addition to that, we see this rapid inflation in commodity prices, and this ultimately feeds into the production process and is pushing uh, product prices up. Um, and uh, furthermore, the companies, uh, the, the industrial fabric of the world, having uh, endured significant damages during the lockdowns of the pandemic, are probably trying now to uh, recover some of these costs and, and damages by increasing the prices to consumers, to the extent they can, of course. So it's a combination of factors. And for that reason, I believe that inflation is here to stay for quite a long time. It could last several years until the economy starts functioning properly again with the same supply and demand balances that we enjoyed before the pandemic. Um, so how does it affect precious metals prices? It affects them dramatically because in times of inflation, precious metals act as a safe haven and store of value. Therefore, they should appreciate in value. Furthermore, as we see now, uh, the central bankers being unable to raise interest rates for fear of destabilizing the economy and causing uh, the, the, the government deficits to explode, we, we have... Uh, a, a, a real inflation, which is traditionally very good for precious metals. So uh, I think the, the outlook for precious metals is very good for the next couple of years at least. Yeah, certainly is a hedge. Um, and do you see it sort of like inflation returning to sort of periods like in the 70s where, you know, it, it's quite out of control? Um, or, um, you know, the Fed you mentioned and running out of options, how to, uh, you know, running out of levers to pull to sort of combat this. Um, so, you know, Precious metals is the logical answer to to to, man, to maneuver into as an investor or indeed as a central bank even. Yes, I, I think there, there is a danger of inflation overshooting any expectation and target. Uh, we know that the liquidity that has been pumped to the the global economy has been uh, unprecedented, and uh, such levels of monetary printing has the the a debasing effect on all the currencies. It's not the US dollar, not the euro, not the, the yen or the pound specifically, but all the major currencies are being debased. They lose their purchasing power. And therefore, uh, it's another boost for inflation and, and a, a long-term support for inflationary forces. So we don't know, of course, uh, where inflation rates are going to go, but uh, it is likely that they will stay at very high levels for, for the foreseeable future. Mm. Certainly. John, um, what's your take on inflation? And can you do you echo some of the sentiment um, that Angelos has mentioned? So I agree with Angelos on the um, the underlying inflation. I think that that will stay high for a little bit. Actually, um, looking at supply chains, I'm quite confident that's the case. Uh, it does take a while for the supply chains to catch up. So I do agree with that. Um, I big picture, how does this affect gold? I think. If inflation keeps going higher, then I think gold is, is great. Um, short term, though, I, I, I never really know because the market always looks at change, rate of change. Um, and we've had a phenomenal run on inflation. And I think inflation is probably going to go a bit higher. But at some point, when you start comparing quarter to quarters, the rate of change, you can't be running at 7, 8, 9% because you'll be going vertical, if you know what I mean. 
So I think at some point the market may pause and things may change a little bit. And so in terms of gold pricing, I think on the long term, I 100% agree, Angelos. Um, shorter term, it will go in ebbs and flows, depending on how you see the rate of change. Yep, certainly. And um, just in follow-up to that, are you, are you seeing more interest sort of from LPs uh, fund and uh, investors coming looking at precious metals now with this uh, macro scenario? So on my, my end, it's hard to tell because um, my gold fund is part of a broader portfolio. Um, but we have definitely been getting interest from generalists on gold uh, just to understand its role. Um, they may not be buying my funds, so I'm not seeing a lot of fresh inflows. Um, I suspect a lot of them might be buying ETFs, though, like the um, either the gold mining ETF or even the gold bullion ETF. Yep. Yeah. And that's just simply because of the ease of access, the sort of the diversity maybe that it offers rather than owning companies or uh, I think for them it's it's quite a good idea because they don't know which stocks they're picking um, so they get a whole diverse portfolio at possibly a lower rate for uh, versus active management fees so I think that's what they're doing um, as a first call if you're trying to allocate a lot of money but very quickly yeah yeah okay let's come back to the companies in a bit and sort of uh, delve into that a bit more. Um, Patrick, let, what's your take? Um, any comments on inflation? Anything to add? Or? Yeah, and no, I think the guys have, have outlined the, the, the two main themes that uh, you know we're, we're, um, we, we think about with inflation as the, the the piece that comes from the pandemic and and, and the supply chain issues. But there's also <clears throat> the fact that there's there's just more money out there. There's, there's a there's a massive massive increase in money supply out there, uh, notably the Fed. I, I live in the States, so uh, we, we hear about this a lot, obviously. Um, and uh, the, the, I think that um, that's, that latter um, issue is, is a much bigger issue for gold investors to think about. And I think that it, it, does te it, it should be um, driving you know, more people to put a little bit more into gold uh, because of, you know, you know what John said. We we don't know really what's going to happen, but but you know you should be prepared at least. Um, and the the big debate in the states is, of course, how quickly can the the Fed reel it all back in, i.e., tapering and raising rates eventually. Um, and those uh, so far, the the Fed has been a lot more dovish than than perhaps a few months ago people had expected. And I think that's what's uh, keeping gold, you know, uh, moving moving positively at least at the moment. It's not really moved back up that much because we we, we haven't seen new highs yet. But um, I tend to think that the the the, the other uh, inflation factor, the transitory um, transitory amount that's uh, coming through from from the supply chain crisis, is really um, going to continue to push um, inflation numbers up, as we saw this morning in the UK. And I think that um, uh, that will then uh, accentuate the problem and uh, we'll see more investment in gold and I think we could see new gold highs next year. Oh, interesting. John, Jonathan, uh, what's your view from London here? I mean, I, I think first of all that the inflation that we're seeing is, is um, I suggest, going to be less, uh, more, persist for longer than, uh, than the Fed currently thinks. Um, and a period when inflation is high and the Fed is relatively dovish should be, should it be positive for, for, for gold. Um, I think in terms of the, the gold equities, just to sort of touch on that, it's not a one-way street. You see a period when the gold price moves up quite sharply, um, and, and that can usually lead to sort of 18 months of supernatural returns for the gold equities. But beyond that, you start to see the second order effects coming through. And we're beginning to see those now. You see oil prices rising, you see in other input prices rising, steel and so on and forth. And the workforce notice that you're making lots of money and will start asking you for pay rises. And so I think in, in terms of the equities, certainly, you know, we could see some margin compression next year, if uh, even if gold remains elevated, as, as those inflationary um, headwinds start to, to, to come to bear on, on, on earnings. But in terms of gold more broadly, you've got two events within the space of 12 years, which are massively positive for gold. Those black swan events, firstly, the global financial crisis, and then the pandemic. And I think what that makes people think is I need something which is in that sort of hard assets. Now, there's a debate to be had about whether that's gold or whether that's Bitcoin or, or what that is now. But I think the case for gold and the case for having something which is a store of value has been uh, unequivocally made in the, last, uh, in the last 12 to 13 years. 
Certainly. Do you think it's sort of overshadowed a little bit by the state of US equities, for instance, being so high and, you know, talk of a crash or um, um, a correction? Well, I think that's degree. the other thing. And and essentially, you've had, had the Fed abandon and, and other central banks abandon the idea of moral hazard. So if the economy is growing, that's great. And equities go up. And if the economy looks like it's not growing, then the Fed sort of pulls all the levers it can to stimulate growth, which is positive for asset prices. So yeah, I, I think that's eaten some of gold's lunch in that if equity prices are going up and you can you know, make more money buying Amazon or buying Tesla or whatever, or, or indeed buying Bitcoin, then um, th- then, then that perhaps eats some of gold launch, but it does. It doesn't fundamentally undermine gold, and it doesn't undermine what gold is. I mean, gold as an asset class has been there for five thousand years now, and 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 it continues to do what it's always done, which is preserve value over time. Yep. If you want short term returns, there are always going to be other things you can buy. But if you want to preserve value over time, then gold is what what you hold. It's a more speculative asset class is sort of overshadowing at the moment. But um, let's let's relate it back to the miners then and the equities. Um, what's your point on uh, valuations at the moment? How do you see um, the valuation of gold miners across the tiers? Are, are they where you would expect? Um, are there some? Is there undervaluation perhaps in some of these producers that are posting uh, great cash flow, great dividends? Um, what's your view? Well, look, most of the equities are still flat down a bit this year. And um, so it's been it's been pretty hard yards for the gold equities this year. And you know even those that have done very well last week, you saw Polymetal Endeavor putting out very strong quarterly results, and you did see a positive response to that. But it's um, I, I, my view, and you know these guys are the ones who the run run money will, will, may have a different view. But it doesn't look like valuations are stretched at the moment. Whether you're looking onto you know, price to nav or EV, EBITDA, whatever you're looking at, it doesn't to me look like valuations are stretched. And, and I think another point with the gold equities, and you now this is particularly interesting given the, um, the the acquisition of Pretium that was announced last week. You know, we are still seeing that that phase of consolidation come through, and that will be something that's very interesting in the gold space over the next few years. People haven't been spending money on expiration. People haven't been finding new deposits. So the only thing you can do is M and A, and so. All that mid-tier and those those people who have ounces in the ground, they become much more interesting in that environment. Um, but no, t- in terms of the producers at the moment, just looking at historical trends over the last 10 years, doesn't look to me like they're stretched. Yep. Interesting. Uh, Angelus, I'll come back to you. What's your take on the sort of equities at the minute across the tiers? And then also this challenge of, you know, like um, showing interest to the market, you know, uh, do, do we need to see consolidation um, and more M&A? Uh, to prove more relevance, um, or uh, do you want to see companies investing more in exploration? Well, I think uh, most of us uh, who are, have been involved uh, with the mining equities, particularly the precious metals mining equities for a long time, have been very surprised at the apparent decoupling of valuations to where the commodity trades at the moment. And this happened over the last, uh, the course of the last uh, 12 months or so. And it uh, almost, in my view, coincided with the opening up of the economies, with the success of the vaccination process, the opening up of the economy, and investors focusing on the growth elements of the economy in the industrial fabric, in the technology sector, etc., and pushing aside the gold mining sector as uh, a kind of a question mark. Uh, and, and but nevertheless, the, the precious metal prices, principally gold, have, have remained at fairly high level. And, and we see now gold again breaking up towards 1900. And what, has, what the strong commodity price has done over these last 12 months is that it has hugely strengthened the balance sheets and the free cash flow generation of the producing gold miners. Uh, to the point that now, uh, I think if you look at uh, general metrics, they probably trade at one third the valuation of the overall market um, in terms of traditional valuations of price to earnings and and free cash flow. Um, And and therefore, it is very interesting to see that uh, still investors are reluctant to step back into the, the, the precious metals miners even though they now portray very traditional fundamental value uh, credentials and increasing dividends, increasing uh, free cash flow payments, uh, free cash flow generation. So uh, I, in my view, I think it's unlikely to, to last for very long. At some point, 
there will be a rotation of capital back into these uh, value uh, propositions, and, and there will be a general re-rating of the miners. Now, with regard to the internal workings of the mining industry, it is obvious that uh, the producing companies are generating so much cash that they have paid down debt, they have, uh, you know, they have started paying dividends, but they are short of growth. Uh, as uh, Jonathan suggested, they have not been investing in, in exploration for many years during the, the bear market, and they are now short of growth. So the, the easy answer is to buy you know, growth companies that control significant deposits. So we're going to see M&A ramping up. Well, we, we are seeing it at the moment, but so far it has concentrated on the producing assets. I think it is now starting to trickle down to the late stage development assets uh, that require more capital and a little bit more time until they come into production and feed into the production process. Yep. But uh, it, will, it is certainly accelerating. Yeah, and that's part of the natural cycle that we've sort of seen yeah. before. Yeah. Okay. John, um, where do you see pockets of value within the mining tiers at the moment? And um, do you have any further comments to reflect on what Angelos and others have said? I think just to answer the valuation call uh, first, there is definitely um, a value out there. There's no question in my mind. Uh, depends on what you look at it. The large caps, genuinely, you can get 7% free cash flow yield after everything. Uh, the mid caps, really, it's up to you. I mean, 15 is not unusual. And then the small caps, depending, I mean, some will be nothing and some will be quite high. So the range varies a lot. Uh, but in my mind, I don't think anybody buys anything on the basis of valuation. Okay, so if I put my generalist hat on, I don't buy a company because I think it's cheap, unless I am a specific value fund, for example. Uh, but if I was just a general investor, I kind of look for something where I think something is going to change, something is going to get better or get stronger or something like that, and that would probably push me over the edge to buy it. And gold, I think, as a mining sector is tough because we are stuck under massive pressures, things like COP26 and the environmental uh, agenda, which is very negative, not just for gold, but for any mining or oil and gas companies. So for generalists to just wake up and buy gold, that's quite a big call. You know, not just valuation, but then he's getting pressure internally about, hey, why are you buying all this stuff? You know, I have to fill up all these crazy forms, okay, just to, <laughs> just to buy all these gold companies. And so I can imagine that I'm a gold mining fund, but if let's say I was a generalist, I'll be like, do I really want to kind of do all this stuff? So I think... For me to see a change in gold mining, um, we need some serious success stories. Okay, and I'm really rooting for the industry here. Okay, so I'm looking at all of you guys and really rooting for you. You know, we need companies that just show really great returns because it's very, very well run. We make lots of money. You know, you buy back shares, you reward shareholders, and 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 see some of those. Um, and I think for me, that, that would be one of the changes. But the real big change, I think, is um, highlighted by, by the fact that the rest of the equity market is still strong. If we see a general turn, then I do agree that even if they didn't believe in gold, it's about rotation and about safety. And that will trigger a re-rate in gold miners. But while the economy is running, I, I agree with Angelos, I don't think people will suddenly just wake up and buy it. But if money's quite cheap and, um, and I'm not getting any return having it in my bank account or anything, I'm going to look at investing. You know, that, that the sort of pandemic triggered a lot of new retail investors, didn't it? So what, do you think this, is com this correction might be coming within global equities or sort of hard to tell really? Just yeah. get positioned. With, with global equities, I genuinely, I, I mean, look, with my generalist hat on, I can make a call for why I think the S&P will keep climbing. I can. The reason I can is because the discount rate that I'm using is so low. You know, when you put interest rates near zero, I can make a value call for anything, really. You know, Bitcoin looks good, everything looks good. So the problem I have is unless there's a massive change in um, interest rates, which, you know, I think, you know, I have no idea what will happen, but that, could be a very, very big trigger. Um, so just sharing more openly, um, what the Fed said about tapering, my biggest concern short term 
is how it will affect the long end of the US bond market. Because if they stop buying it, the, the yields will just start to rally, not because there's anything wrong, it's just that nobody is buying it. That alone will change the shape of the yield curve, and which may affect equities. That may change the shape of the um, real rates curve. So for me, those are the things I'm watching very closely. Um, so far, the danger signs aren't there yet, but it's on my watch list. Excellent. Patrick, um, could I ask you about um, any comments on what John's just said, but also um, where do you see value within the gold miners at the moment? What does your fund tend to look at? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think these things, um, uh, gold stocks, uh, you know, I remember, you know, uh, many, many decades ago, I guess, when gold stocks, you know, you'd, you, there are only a few of them, and they were like South African gold stocks, and, and you'd buy them, and they would be, you know, 10% yield, you know, simple as that. And it wasn't, it wasn't a special sector or anything. It was just at the end of, that was just at the end of, um, you know, the, the, the big run up that we had. Um, now the stocks are, are getting up there. The yield is there. I think the market is cautious, though. It's very cautious. On, on gold stocks across the sector. So, we, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time now with the juniors as opposed to the, the larger cap stocks that I used to be uh, looking at mostly. But um, I, I think that, you know, across the sector, there's, there's depressed valuations. And what we've seen this year is basically gold hasn't hit new highs. It's been basically therefore down. And so investors are saying, well, I'm not really ready to, to buy that yet. So that we'll hold off because... It, you know, if I read the report from, from my bank, the, the stock report from my bank, he's going to tell me that gold next year or the year after is going to be 1350. That's what one of the biggest banks in the world has, and that's what most banks have. Uh, so if, if you're a retail investor and you look at, you get the report on gold price forecast from your, your analyst at, at a big bank, he's going to call the gold price down over the next couple of years. So it's like, oh, I don't know whether I want to be in there. So I think I think um, across the board valuations are, 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 are depressed because people have been expecting the Fed to start the taper and, and it's basically written into the the, 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 the uh, expectations. If as the Fed starts not to do that and, and and things start to slip in terms of that timetable, I think people will start to consider the sector more actively. Gold prices you know will go up as they have begin beginning to go up right now. Um, so that's a positive outlook, I think. But I, coming to valuation in the sector, I know that the producers are, are trading on pretty low multiples relative to history. Um, but I do think that um, uh, there's, in, there's incredible value in the expiration end of the business. And the reason why there is, uh, especially at the earlier stages, is that, is that most of the money, the specialist money in our industry, is crammed into that sort of... Uh, uh, advanced stage project come produce a project. Before that, there's just not much money looking at it. So therefore, that's where the best value is. And I think some of the majors, some of the major gold producers are beginning to see that. And they can come along and they can get excellent, excellent projects earlier stage at really, really for nothing. You know, the entry price is, is, is incredibly low. How early are we sort of talking here? Sorry to interject. Well, I mean, as early as you can see the whites of the eyes of a, of a, of a, of a good gold project coming towards you. It doesn't have to be that late or that early, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really then a matter of risk and reward, you know, what price you pay versus, you know, what, what it might be. So um, there's, a, there's a lot more. Um, you're either a pure speculator or you're very, very detail-oriented to be able to understand, you know, what's value and what's not in that sector, which is a bit of an issue for the, the earlier stage companies. Um, but I, I do think that because the money, the royalty company is not there, the, um, the private equity companies are not there, and these are the guys with the big money in the industry. And the gold funds are really not there as much as perhaps they, the, maybe that's changing, but, but I think that uh, there's been an incredible focus on production. And so uh, there's great value in the explorers, and that, that, that's where I would be definitely looking. Yeah. Jonathan, what's your view on exploration um, you, and how the explorers are faring within this tier? Um, are you recommending explorers at the moment? You think there's good value there? Um, I, I are think they struggling? I mean, I think it's, it's very tough to get institutional money in to anything at the early stage of exploration. And, and, and equally, there can be a problem if the 
if an explorer finds something and they find it too early and it, it's just retail money in there, it can drive it too hard. And then you get to a point where the institutions say, well, that, that value is just not great, you know, not going to stack up from our perspective. So look, exploration's hard. I don't think we've seen many really interesting exploration, new exploration projects um, come across in, in, in the last few years. A lot of it is reheated projects that are being sort of rebadged for a new, a new cycle. Um, and, and so, no, I mean, exploration is a very interesting space, but it is, as everyone said, capital constrained. And it's, it's retail money at the lower end and very specialist money at, at the sort of, uh, at the slightly more advanced level. But it's still not one that the broader investor public have embraced as they did do, I guess, prior to Brex in the late 1990s in Canada. It's not got that, you know, vavoom about it because people who, the type of people who invest in that are looking at crypto or tech. And um, so no, exploration is very niche at the moment. Um, there's definitely opportunities there, but it's it, it's it's not really taken off yet. Um, I'd like to open to the floor if there are any questions. Does anyone want to ask our panel anything specific? No? Okay, um, I wanted to come down to sort of like um, regional focus now as well. Um, there's been some uh, interesting M&A in, uh, and acquisitions in West Africa. That seems to be a sort of an emerging gold hub. Um, what's the take there um, in terms of uh, you know interest for for gold plays in that region? Um, or, or feel free to talk about other areas where we're seeing some really good mining projects coming through. Good activity. Anyone like to take that? Sorry, just to clarify, did you mean for M and A or just new exploration stories? Exploration story, um, but obviously link it to the M and A that we expect to be coming. Look, looking at West Africa specifically, I mean, what we've seen is, um, you know, a, a period of consolidation. We've seen some Chinese buyers come into the market in a, in a way that they didn't in the last cycle. We've seen assets sort of cycle in and out of groups. You know, there are people like, um, I guess, Endeavor, who've, you know, successfully cycled out, Tapakoto cycled out, Agbao. Uh, we saw Golden Star go out last week. But, you know, those are all, you know, it, it's existing producers changing hands. It is not, um, you know, big new exploration. Even last year with Taranga getting taken out um, by, by Endeavour, Semifo getting taken out by Endeavour, that was a sort of part of that consolidation phase. I, I can't think of, aside from uh, Cardinal's Nandimi right. deposit, which was a new discovery, I can't think of anything big in West Africa in the last couple of years that's really sort of, really sort of gripped the market. Um, and, and that reflects, as we sort of discussed in the last point, a period of... Um, certainly, if you look at the Sahel region around Burkina Faso and Mali, you know political difficulties and security difficulties, and and, and a period when exploration is massively out of favour and people aren't putting dollars into the ground. Yeah, okay. like, likewise, I, I'd like to uh, endorse what Jonathan says, and we have seen the activity on the producing assets, but also on these what we call late stage development projects projects that have the feasibility study, they are ready to move towards production and require the financing and the support of a much larger company to push them uh, through the, the, the finish line. Uh, but below that, we see some activity among the junior companies for some earlier stage projects. But I think, again, there, what uh, in people should make a distinction is what is uh, it's the issue of marginality. The, we see some projects that were abandoned in the 80s or 90s and are now brought, being brought to the market uh, claiming that they are projects that are you know, almost ready to come into production. And, and these are things that probably did not make sense for, for two decades because the commodity price was low. And now that we see gold price rising, uh, obviously they are marginally profitable. Uh, but I think the, the seasoned operators, the, the mid-tier producers, the larger companies, are still very wary of touching that stuff. You know, they, they will not go near these companies unless they see a clear value proposition that can come to production very quickly. Yep. Please. The only other thing I was going to say is that I, I agree, in terms of exploration, new projects is not many, but the normally in a normal functioning market, the way that gets arbitrage away is usually the producers. Because if you have got a high rating and you are the producer, you can use your paper to buy something that is on a very low PNA, for example. The reason they haven't come in tells me a lot 
about how the mining CEOs are thinking um, and where their confidence lies. So if you had a very strong long-term outlook on gold pricing and you're very bullish that let's say, I don't know, make a number up, let's say you think gold's going to go 5,000, you would hoover up a lot of stuff. But the reason you're not is because you're not confident. And the second thing I do have to say, this ESG thing is freaking me out. Not so much me personally, but I have seen CEOs coming to me in this last quarter, and that was top of the agenda to talk to me. And these are big companies. Because they don't know what to do, or they're not sure about how, you know, the sort of the green narrative and sort of uh, COP, uh, how does that reflect on gold let, mining? Let me show you an example, and I'm going to name names, so you may guess a company, you may not. But this guy said to me, okay, I want to talk to you about three things. I want to talk to you about m and I want to talk to you about ESG. And he said that every company is under pressure to say they're going to cut their greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions by 30% by 2030. He said, I can't do that. Okay. He said, I can't do that because I can't change my fleet from running on diesel to electric, it doesn't work. Second, he said, depending on the geography of my mine, the grid power they draw, if it's, if it's diesel, it's diesel, you know, or, or if, it's, if it's hydro, it's hydro, if it's coal, it's coal. I can't change that. So how does that affect my thinking on M&A? And he says, well, I now have to look at assets where I think, maybe an underground mine is better than an open pit because I don't have to run so many trucks. Okay. And he said, but an underground mine means I can't buy something big. Okay. So these CEOs are using this ESG to think because they are under pressure to tell everyone they're going to cut it by 30% and be net zero by 2050. Most of them cannot be net zero by 2050. It's not possible greenwashing if you say you can but you can't and we're seeing a lot of that in other sectors or uh, people launching funds and things like that for instance um, but yeah that's a, it's a great point it's a shame that we've come up to the end of time on this but yeah just uh, to the other panelists quickly ESG is it sort of slowing down capital a bit um, is it forcing uh, a lot more thinking uh, from investors and companies I, I mean, I, I'm actually writing something at the moment, which is sort of looking at all of this and looking at historical trends. Mining companies actually generally have a pretty good t t story to tell on the social and governance side. Most companies tick most of that criteria. But as John said, what you simply can't do is all of a sudden magic up a fleet that runs on hydrogen because the technology doesn't exist and the, and the kit doesn't exist. Depending on where you are, you can't magic up renewables. You know, if you're reliant on a grid, you can't change that power mix. And not everywhere is going to be suitable for wind, solar or, or, or hydro. So my, my expectation would be you'll see a lot of people who can installing solar and renewable electricity over the next few years. You'll see hydrogen fuel trucks coming in towards the end of the decade. But the technology doesn't exist at the moment. And, and the other thing that you can't get away from in the mining industry is that grades are declining. They're declining by 2% a year in copper. They're declining by 1.5% a year in gold. And you're having to process more rock with, uh, with, with, with to, to produce the same amount of metal. And you know, no matter what you do, you can't get away from that. So last year, um, looking at 2020 versus 2019, um, there was a good story to tell in terms of GHG, GHG emissions to revenue because revenue went up because commodity prices went up. But if you actually look at it per rock ton, per ton of rock mined, it, it, it's flat to getting slightly worse because um, but because you're having to process more ore to get the same amount of metal, and and that that problem is intractable. But in terms of a lot of the parts of the piece, in terms of putting in policies, in terms of particular emissions, in terms of everything else. Um, the mining companies do, are doing an increasingly good job. They are killing fewer people. So if the companies under our coverage, you look back six years, this includes Rio Tinto, BHP, they were killing about 30 people a year. Now they're killing four or five. If you look at the long-term injury, lo lo lost time injury frequency rate, it's halved over the last six or seven years. There's a good story here. Yep. Still four or five too many, but, but yes, but yeah. It is. I, I, I'm that, not saying... The, the trajectory is good. And yeah, it's a, it's a great point. You know, how do we scale... Um, uh, without while, while reducing impact, and that that is the sort of perennial challenge, I guess, of mining, um, fitting in with this copper agenda and the likes. 
Uh, anyway, look, we're, we're out of time. We should do a session on ESG and gold mining next time, I think. That would be, that would be quite apt. Um, anyway, round of applause to our panel. Thank you very much. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to...